Hello, my name is Nikita, and I'll be talking about how to make PyTorch for yourself and for community better. And I think that's kind of an interesting topic, and uh, well, thank you for the introduction, but I don't. I would not consider myself a machine learning engineer because PyTorch is a machine learning framework, but you don't need to be a machine learning engineer to be able to contribute to PyTorch. So it's a much more broader project. So quick synopsis of what I'm going to talk, talk about. So what if you're new to ML? What if something is broken with your program? What if you have an idea how to help? What if you want to help? And how we test the changes in PyTorch? So let's start from the beginning. I don't know how many people are familiar with what PyTorch is. Great, I think, uh, then I probably have to, can skip the slide, but quickly, if you want to start with PyTorch, if you haven't done, not everyone raise their hands, you know, it's a great time, you can just boot up Collab, run some tutorials, and you'll be rocking with machine learning. So, do it. Also, don't forget that you might have a powerful ML tool right on your laptop or in your gaming PC, and most of the ML framework supports that, which is a great feature of the NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. Anyway, so what if something is broken? Don't ask questions, there is Google. But if something's really broken, try to reach out to community. So PyTorch have like uh, two major uh, feedback channels when people just want to ask questions is discuss.pytorch.org or questions channel on Slack. On the other hand, if you believe that something is broken with PyTorch, especially if you have a program that used to work before and no, no longer working now, file an issue. The main way of communicating with PyTorch developers is through GitHub issues. Uh, like, people might think that, you know, oh, if I know somebody from Meta, I'm going to send him an email and uh, this person will reply. Most often that's not the case. I probably check my email once a week. I check GitHub every day, three or four times a day. So, not, and not just myself, right? A lot of lots of developers, like, check GitHub issues. So, that's the main way of communicating, like, what is wrong. Quick interlude. So, you submitted an issue and it's getting ignored. You wonder why. Well, maybe its title is not very descriptive. Maybe you put a screenshot instead of text and the screenshot is a really, really small font size. Maybe you never mentioned your system configuration. Or you, you submitted this report not to the PyTorch repository. So, first and foremost, PyTorch repository is PyTorch, PyTorch on GitHub, and please try to write the descriptive issues. So, how to report a good issue? First of all, try to reproduce this with the latest PyTorch. Uh, currently, uh, I, d I don't know if like a lot of projects do that, but at PyTorch we try to fix everything in trunk, but we rarely fix something with all the releases, unless it's an absolutely horrible, horrible, horrible regression. So if you want community to fix something in software that was released two years ago, you can try to argue, but your best option is to say, you know, it is broken with the latest release. Um, Another is try to get smaller reproducer. Uh, ML is an interesting field when you can run for days and days and, uh, you know, finally something crashes or run out of memory. And you immediately rush to submit an issue. It feels great, but it's not very actionable to the people who are looking at it. Uh, another, so if you can have a smaller reproducer, submit it. If you have a collab notebook, that's great. If you, like, just a piece of code, also great. Also, run, collect environment. So collect environment is a tool we built into every PyTorch distribution that allows you to collect basic information about your system, namely what is your Python runtime version, what's your PyTorch version, what hardware accelerators you have, and what other ecosystem libraries you have. Because sometimes other libraries can interfere with PyTorch, or PyTorch can interfere with other libraries. If possible, submit the full logs. Very often people say, you know, like, I run my program and here's the three lines of logs, like, memory, memory out of memory. Or I try to access like a tensor outside of boundaries. Not very helpful. Having a bit, bit logs before that would help us to identify what's going on. And if possible, when developers ask you questions, try to follow up. So how the same process looks from, oh, sorry. Did I? Okay, so how, I can probably talk about if you have an idea. So. If you have an idea about how to improve PyTorch, issues is also a way to communicate about that. So you submit a feature request issue saying, you know, I have this idea, this is why it's great, but try to get like a good explanation why you think it will be beneficial, not just for you, but for the ML community. And if change is something fundamental, start with a special sub-repository called request for comments when you try to like 
engage with more than one individual or more than one entity are trying to find out what to do. And yeah, like answer questions. If you say, oh, I want this like great optimizer and then don't provide any details why it's needed, people probably would not pay too much attention. So how the same process looks from the PyTorch developer community point of view? Uh, like every day we have a person who looks at all the incoming issues and assign labels. Those labels notify people who are interested of monitoring the label about what is going on. Uh, when labels assigned, those people who have more knowledge about uh, this particular area of the project might ask questions or might have an insight or might have an idea about, about like, what is going on. For the so-called high priority issues, we mark them and we have like a group discussion about are they really high priority and how we can quickly address or mitigate them. Because if there is a workaround, even though it's unpleasant, sometimes software have bugs, so it's easy to say it is workaround and we'll fix it later. So now that we like done with finding issues, what if you want to contribute to community in some ways? First of all, thank you very much. It's a rare gift and everybody will appreciate like additional help. You can start by participating in discussions. You don't need to be an expert, you don't need to like like good intention is always needed, right? And then you can learn and other can and help others. Um, helping down breaking complex uh, problems into an easier one. If you like an intermediate ML practitioner and you see that somebody submits an issue which is very complex and you can probably help them identify and narrow down to an easier problem. And last but not least, like if you want to co start coding, we mark issues. Again, I started with labels. Uh, we mark issues with like a actionable or good first time issue, and it means that if you want to try your hand at contributing at PyTorch, then maybe that's your opportunity. And as the name suggests, like PyTorch is Python, about 50% and about 50% C++. So you don't need to be like a system level engineer to be able to contribute, and especially with like a new features like Torch Compile, which is very Pythonic, so almost everything is implemented in Python. You can implement features that show tremendous uh, performance gains and purely in PyTorch. So C++ plus knowledge is not mandatory. So if you want to submit a pull request, what to do, or maybe what not to do. Like, it is very important that your pull request have a good description. Fixes blah is not a very good description. A uh, 300 character long string is not a very good description. If you want to fix some bug that was reported previously, other regression test, we love testing. Because otherwise, if somebody fixes something, then somebody later, not because of the malice, but because of the lack of testing, will break it again. And that's the worst thing that we want to deliver to the community, is a software that used to work, and now it doesn't. This is why, in the beginning, I said that, you know, like, please, if you have, uh, like, regressions, report it right away. One PR should try to fix one problem. Like, do not try to aggregate everything into one pull request. And I don't think it is specific to a PyTorch uh, community. It is kind of a general rule of many open source projects because if you expect somebody to review your changes, it is better when they have a clear idea of what those changes are doing. And it's easier to reason and understand and provide feedback if you're just making modification to one feature, one function. Also, preferring from submitting a big PRs on new features without discussing it with the community first. Because you made substantial investment of your time and knowledge and probably money into writing this change and nobody cares about it. It is upsetting. But the reason maybe other people don't care about it is they don't know how great, great it is and they don't know because they haven't seen an issue or participated in a discussion. And also like why community is sometimes reluctant to accept new big code contributions. Because it's very easy to contribute code but it's easy but boring to maintain it. And maintenance is something that becomes a significant part of like, responsibilities that the Pytorch developer community have to deal with. And don't worry about finding the right reviewer. We try to find you one. And if not, you can look at the people who modified this file recently and try to mention them and say, can you please look at the PR? But also, please don't be discouraged if you don't receive a timely feedback. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, like developer community is overwhelmed. 
by dealing with them having issues or, or working on the features that we want to present for the next release. So let's talk a little bit about a pull request lifecycle, which I think is pretty common for the PyTorch, but there are a couple of caveats. So you propose a PR. As a regular review cycle starts when the people that are assigned to look at your PR or just the people who contribute to PyTorch regularly look at the, uh, at the contents and make a suggestions about what needs to be improved, like how to add the test, maybe suggest like better function name, uh, point out like some error checking, uh, I don't know, time constraint considerations or memory and so on and so forth. In the background, CI started. Unfortunately, we cannot start the CI by default to new contributors. You ask why, like it is a common feature. <laughs> uh, this is something that changed in the last probably three years when people start to abuse free CI for their personal purposes, right? We test by torch on GPUs, so essentially you can train a small network for free. This is why, unfortunately, we no longer allow like any PRs to be tested on our system because that gives you access to lots of GPUs. But again, once you contribute to PyTorch, you will be a regular contributor and we will trust your PRs more and uh, CI will be running. Um, also, we cannot run all the CI all the time, so we introduced like, we'll, we love labels. We love doing lots of things in open and we use labels, as I mentioned before, for issues, uh, classification, we also use labels for selecting which uh, subset of tests should be running on your PR. So to add additional labels, uh, like to add additional testing, you like slap a CI flow slash something label, I will talk about it later, and uh, you will see more testing, test running. Uh, when the review is obtained, merge process can be initiated by talking to the bot. Why you don't press a button? First of all, we want to make sure that all the testing is finished, and uh, also sometimes, uh, I, I'm going to talk about it later, we, you can have red on your tests, but your PR is still mergeable. This is why we want the bot to monitor the progress of the testing and whenever the testing is done, like do it automatically. Unfortunately, after PR is merged, it's not 100% guarantee that your work is done there. It can be reverted. And I can talk a bit, I, I will talk a bit later about the reasons for reverts. So, pull request life cycle. So, failures, as I mentioned, not necessarily the author's problem. The reason could be that you based your PR on the broken uh, commit when you started working on the change. One way to avoid it is we have a special label called viable strict, which contains only commits that we know that all the extended testing has been run on and they're green. So if you start on those commits, it's very, very unlikely that you'll be affected by some um, issues that crept up from the broken trunk. Um, uh, there, is, there is a tool called Dr. CI. Well, it's not a tool, it's just a comment on the issue. So whenever you submit an issue, we have a bot, the same bot that will merge your commits, that will look at your commit, and whenever you receive a signal, it analyzes the reason for success or failure and give you a summary. So for example, if trunk was broken, you can go into GitHub, look at the commit that your PR is based on, check all the like, failure signatures and compare it with the ones you see in your PR, but it's long and boring. So we build a bot for you that can tell you like, you know, this can go as planned, we have a one flaky failure, we rerun it, it's green, and we have a couple of tests broken on trunk, but again, doesn't seem to be a problem. So how do we, as like a PyTorch developer community, aware of this regressions that happens post-land. So again, we build a tool called HUD, which gives you like a bird's eye view of the status of CI on the every commit. So you can see in, in the row, it's individual commits, like there's a time it was committed, hash sum, title, who committed it, and then there is some testing, right? So the column represents individual tests. Well, that's the lie. This column represents an aggregated test. I, I can show you later like how many tests we actually run in every PR. And another way, like if you want to, like, but this gives you a bird's eye view, right? So you know that something passed or failed, and if it failed, you just see a red X, not very actionable. So you can look into the individual PR, and again, we try to highlight not the job that failed, but the actual individual test name, and give you a, a command that you can run to reproduce the failure on your local machine. Um, another quick question is, why we're not running the artifacts, why we're not using the artifacts we build during CI for releases. The reasons for, the, for that are twofold. One is when we're building for CI, we want to build the binary that quote unquote works on my machine. So the binary that works on the runners that we allocated for ourselves that have a certain software pre-installed that we depend for the uh, 
PyTorch to work. But when you want to build a package, it's not as easy because you need to de deploy something called Hermetic package. So like uh, PyPy standards say that your package cannot depend on anything by six libraries on Linux and similarly on Windows. So you cannot say, oh, if I want to accelerate with GPUs, I just assume that user will install the GPU runtime. You should package all the GPU runtime that you depend on into your package. Another reason why we like run continuous deployment separately is because when we do continuous deployment, we want to build it for more hardware configurations than uh, we do in during CI. So for CI, I only care about one GPU flavor that I'm going to run my CI on. But when I want to give you a package, I want the package to be available on all the GPUs that like currently on the market. Well, with some caveats. Um, speaking about release cadence, so we try to have like a quarterly PyTorch releases. So 2.1 was released, I think like months ago. We try to do one or two patch releases. So when we release the minor release, we can notice some regressions from the previous release and we say, well, it would be good to be patched. So we release one or two patch releases between every minor release. And we also have nightly builds. So if you want to try latest the greatest PyTorch, you can always try nightly at your own risk though, because we can introduce regressions, but again, we build nightly of this viable strict branch, so technically it should be green. So why do we build all this complexion, like complexity? It looks like GitHub already provides you, like developers a great utility to do everything you want. Uh, so like why this is all needed. Uh, PyTorch review structure historically is not very flat. PyTorch is, well, I wouldn't say it's an amalgamation of many projects, but it have different parts that have like a different strong code owners and these code owners can delegate the review, uh, uh, sorry, the review privileges to like uh, other developers. We don't want to interfere with that, but Git does not have a good mechanism of saying, you know, if only these folders are modified, these people can review, but if that folders modified, that people need to have review. So we need to build our own like system on top of that, and this is handled by both. Um, another reason is we just cannot run all the testing all the time. It takes too much time, and frankly, it's too expensive because, again, ML testing needs to be run on GPUs. GPUs are not easy to find. And, again, if you run everything sequentially from start to finish, it will take more than a day to test a single pull request. And developers don't want to, wa to wait that long. Um, also, we need to validate that PyTorch works not just on Linux, but on Windows and Mac. Not across all the hardware, like not across all the accelerators, but at least for the CPU runners. Um, and the code for all this is uh, stored in PyTorch test infra. And I think with that, I'm open for QA. But looks like everyone's tired. Any questions? No, so you like whenever your pull request is approved and merged, like it will be available in the next nightly build. But yes, otherwise you need to wait for the next release to get your changes in, right? Yes, so if you uh, look at the top level MD files for the repository, there is a contributor's MD and uh, some that contains more links to wiki pages. There's also a couple of fantastic, uh, like one of the core contributors at Yang runs a fantastic uh, blog about like contributing to PyTorch where he discusses about like how certain parts are um, implemented and that can help one to learn what they need to do if they want to contribute to those parts. And again, uh, I think like uh, the question you're asking, like is there enough, enough documentation? If one feels there's not enough, I think that's a great opportunity to contribute. And again, uh, the success of the 
open source project is not necessarily about code contributions, but about all the ecosystems around it. So if people are willing to contribute more to testing, to uh, documentation, to like community in general, just answering the questions, that, that, that's great. Anyone any, any else? Uh, I work with Torch Audio a lot. Do you know what uh, opportunities or, or, or things that you're looking to develop in Torch Audio that I could contribute to are? Uh, so, again, I think the idea is similar. You should look into Torch Audio project and look for the good first-time issues. So I, I'm yeah. more focused on PyTorch, but uh, like I, I, I bet there are some issues that people want to, like some problems that people want to solve. Uh, one, I can think of though maybe it's not less of a ML and more of a system engineering issue is I wish there was a more reliable way of decoding data formats, right? So I want to be able to use Torch Audio with MP3, Flex, VAVs, you name it, and always be able to get like a tensor out of it. Cool, thanks. I'll look into that. Sure. I guess then, no more questions. Yeah. Thank you.